Good morning, Mountain View family. Thank you so much for joining us today online. We are so happy that you're here, and we're confident there's something here for you, and we're just happy to be here with you in this moment. My name's Charles. I'm one of the new residents here, and I'm super excited to learn and grow and serve alongside you. If you're new, we'd love to welcome you, and you can be welcomed by filling out a connection card online at ncmvw.org slash connect. Also, if you have a prayer request and there's something that's been on your heart and you'd really appreciate some intentional prayer, if you also go to mtnvw.org slash connect, you can fill out a prayer request there as well. We're so thankful that you're here, and we also want to say, hey, if you want to follow us on social media, we're available on YouTube and Facebook and Instagram, and you can find us by searching Mountain View Christian Church. And lastly, we're so thankful for the generosity of the church and your willingness to give. If you'd like to continue to give or even start today, you can give by going to ntmvw.org slash give. Thank you so much for joining us. We think there's something here for you this morning. Let's worship together. Oh man, that is such a sweet, beautiful song. Unfortunately, that's not how we're going to start this evening. I would like to start tonight by doing a little segment I like to call Things That Make Me Angry. Do you want to know what really makes me angry? Disrespect. Just in any way, shape, or form, disrespect makes me very angry. I was having a conversation recently with a parent who was telling me about some struggles that they were having uh, with one of their children, and they were telling me this story about how they had asked their child to do something, like the dishes or whatever, like multiple times, and finally, in a moment of exasperation, the parent says to the child, Child, did you hear what I asked you to do? And the child responds by looking up and saying, yeah, I heard you the last 10 times. <gasps> right? You, you feel it, don't you? Like just that moment, if you're a parent, the hairs on the back of your neck start to stand up. I'm literally sweating right now telling you this story. And I was when it was told to me because I am a parent. And I cannot imagine those words coming out of my son's mouth. Furthermore, I cannot imagine how I would respond if I actually heard him say those things to me. If my son ever spoke to me the way that that child spoke to her parent, <laughs> it would not be good for him. And all the parents in the room said, amen, that's right, because you feel it. You feel for this person. You had an instant, instant emotion to that response, to that, to that story, and that emotion for me was anger. I was angry for this parent. I was like, oh, man, and so what did you do is what I wanted to know and trying to give her pointers on how to really bring it back to them. That makes me angry. Disrespect makes me angry in any way, shape, or form. You know what else makes me angry? Rush hour traffic. I'm a commuter, so I travel in a car distances to get to work. And it's not the traffic itself that makes me angry. I can deal with that. I have some books on tape. I can do some other things. It's totally fine. It's not the traffic. It's the people on the highway. It is the people on the road. They are the worst. I have seen it Oh, I have seen all the things. I have seen someone drive literally like this with their cell phone in hand doing this on the highway like this, 75 miles an hour, driving like this with their cell phone in their face. And I'm honking like, what are you doing? Pay attention. It's the worst. I have seen kids out of car seats just running around in the back seat, climbing up into the front seat. And I'm thinking, who is not pulling you over because you should not have a license to drive a vehicle? It makes me 
angry. The ridiculousness that's taking place on the roads all the time. You know what else makes me angry? Abuse. Abuse of any kind, especially abuse to children. I don't have space in my brain for it. I cannot imagine how someone could ever bring themselves to hurting another human being, let alone the most innocent amongst us, our children. I don't get it. It doesn't, I don't, I can't fit it. I can't make it fit in my brain. It makes no sense to me. So my first response is to be angry. I'm so angry about that. You know what else makes me angry? When bad guys win. I used to watch a show, maybe some of you have watched it, it's called Law and Order. It's a good show. It's a very, very good show. And it is supposed to be like a depiction, an artistic representation of real life cases and real life stories, things that have actually happened. And I had to stop watching it because it made me angry. Because there's a lot of times in our justice system where the bad guy goes free who obviously did something bad and should be punished, but because of some sort of whatever in our laws, they were allowed to just go free. And I don't understand it. And I know it's supposed to be pretend, but it would make me angry. I was so angry. How is this possible? Because I know this happens in the real world, and this is unacceptable. I don't know if you've noticed, but we're going to be talking about anger today. And I want you to know that while I was putting the sermon together, I was deeply, personally convicted about this topic. Because I have been dealing with a situation in my own life that has spurned a lot of anger. And I have had to repent to others about it and to my God about it. And it's been really, really, really hard for me. And I think if we were honest with ourselves, we're probably more angry than we realize. I consider myself to be relatively me, even keel, especially when it comes to the high pressure of my job. And I know those of you who have high pressure jobs, you can relate. But man, I find more often than not, my first response is to be angry. Anger is an immensely powerful, and I'm going to venture to say a little bit addicting emotion. It's easy to just resolve to anger, the first place people go, no matter what the situation is. Something sad is happening, and I bet you you'll find someone in the world who's angry about it and not sad about it. For some people, it is a go-to emotion, and I really do believe at some level there might be a little bit of an addiction going on. It's an easy emotion to fall into. And I believe that we, as a believers, as the church, we flirt with it far too often, and we address it far too little. So I would like to address it today with you. And of course, we're going to turn to the Word of God in order to address it. We're going to be in a couple of places, starting in the book of Ephesians chapter 4, if you have your Bibles. Paul is addressing the church in Ephesus, and he is talking about how they're supposed to live and conduct themselves as new believers in the early church. And this is what he has to say to them about anger in verses 26 and 27 of chapter 4. He says this, In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. There's three anger things going on here that take place. First is, in your anger, do not sin. The next is, don't let the sun go down while you're angry. And the last is, don't give de the devil a foothold. I want to talk about these three types of anger that you see here, because it's quite a mouthful that Paul gives to the early believers. This first type of anger that he's talking about, in your anger, do not sin, is the translation of a righteous anger. A righteous anger. Now that is usually the first emotion that we feel when people are being treated poorly or something is unfair or there's a lot of injustice in our world or when we experience hurtful things by someone else. And it's made even worse when it's someone else that we love or that we care about. I know you've heard of the term righteous anger. Jesus expresses righteous anger throughout his life and ministry. He does it with the Pharisees multiple times. He's angry with their hard hearts. He doesn't understand why they don't understand. <laughs> You're supposed to be teachers of the law, but yet you seem to be the most confused out of everyone here in the group. And he is frustrated and angry with their hardened hearts. Probably the most obvious and the most famous of his righteous anger is when he kind of flipped some tables in the temple courts. He was frustrated and angry with the commercialism that had turned his temple into what he called a den of thieves. But the thing you have to understand about this righteous anger is he wasn't responding to an individual, he was responding to sin. 
There was sin in the camp, and he was righteously angry about the sin that was taking place. That is a righteous anger. This anger is an okay one, but like you see that Paul says here, in your anger, do not what? Sin. In your righteous anger, do not sin. And I promise you, it is a very thin, fine line between righteous anger and crossing over into sinful behavior. The second one you hear is don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. Now, this Greek word here, this is a good Greek word for you, is paraurgismos. Everybody say it with me. Paraurgismos. Very good. It is anger that is followed by indignation. It is anger that is followed by irritation. Here's a good way to think about this anger. This is the, I'm angry, I can't stop thinking about it, or it keeps me up at night, I'm so angry about it. It has soured my mood toward this person. I am justified in feeling this way. I have every right to feel the way I do because of what took place. I no longer trust this person to be in my inner circle. I don't trust this person the way I did before this situation happened. I'm ready to cancel this person forever, or I'm ready to cut this person out of my life. Parorgismos. And Paul says, don't let the sun go down while you are still parorgismos, while you are still angry. Now, here's the thing. Paul's concern here is not for, and this is important, it's not for your obligation to anger. His concern is preventing your anger from causing you to sin because your focus should be on preventing your anger from causing you to sin. I think sometimes we think that we should have permission to see anger all the way out to its fullest extent. Anger is emotion. It's an emotion that God gave us. God can handle all of our emotions, and that is true. Sometimes I think that we think that I'm angry, so I'm allowed to play anger out all the way to the finish line. And Paul is saying, no, you're not, because that line crosses over into sin. So he's not interested in whatever you feel, whatever personal obligations you think you have to anger. He's more concerned about preventing you from sinning. Now, allowing yourself to feel angry, yes. Letting it slip into unhealthy behaviors, not great. This was actually the best marriage advice that my wife Tara and I ever received was this very thing. Many years ago when we got married, the elders at this church threw a party for us, which I thought was kind of really cool. And uh, we went over to one of the elders' homes, and we had a great meal and fellowship, and then all the elders kind of sat in a circle around us, and they gave us marriage advice. And I'm telling you, there was like hundreds of years of marriage between all of these elders and their spouses that were represented in the room. And the number one piece of advice that came up over and over and over again, almost by every elder, was simply this. Don't go to bed angry. When you are figuring out how to be in a relationship with one another, don't go to bed angry. And man, they were right. They were so right. Because sometimes, in the absence of information, our minds have this tendency to fill in the gaps with the worst case scenario. How many of you guys have experienced this before? I don't have all the facts, but someone hurt me. And all I can do is stew on it and ruminate because I'm missing facts. And then my brain just inserts worst case scenarios. This person did it because they hate me. They did it because they don't care about me. They did it because they were intentionally trying to hurt me. Anybody ever been there? Now, in my experience, I know this, I can't speak for everyone, but in my experience, the percentage of situations that fall into that category are actually slim, believe it or not. Most of the time, my once righteous anger turned out to be the result of a a miss, a miscommunication, a misunderstanding, a misrepresentation. I was misheard, misquoted, misunderstood. Most of the time. There are people out there, and it's unfortunate when you run into them, that are really legitimately trying to hurt you. But most of my experiences... I have come to find out after getting the whole story, I probably didn't have a reason to be as angry as I was at first go. And that's hard for me to admit. I'm almost embarrassed to say it. I'm embarrassed to say it because it was so easy for me to go to. A thing happened, and it happened to me, and I'm instantly angry. And I didn't give someone the benefit of the doubt. And what does that say about me? Paul goes on to say this, the third thing, do not give the devil a foothold. 
Because here's what happens when anger goes unchecked. It can turn into thumos, which is the Greek word for an anger that turns into rage. Rage. Living out your anger in very destructive ways. And here is where the devil thrives. The word foothold here is literally the word place. And what Paul is saying is don't give the devil a place in your heart and in your mind. Don't create a place for him. Don't give him a foothold. Clearly, anger was a very easy access point for believers, which is why Paul felt the need to address it. Then he goes on in verse 31 to say this. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Those are big words. Bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, malice. All these words express hostility and actions that destroy human relationships. The focus of this passage is for us as believers to act. There is an action word that takes place at the very beginning. It is get rid of all of these things. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, we are able to get rid of all these things. If you've ever been to an anger management class, you know how difficult and how hard it is to get rid of all these things. Now, in contrast, verse 32 sums up what we should replace anger with. And this is what he says. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. There's a great author by the name of Lynn Kaufman who wrote these words in regards to our anger. He says this, I believe God wants to lead us beyond managing our anger to guiding us into the blessed waters of, and I love this, gracious engagement. Gracious engagement. I really think he's on to something. Verse 31 that we just saw deals with all the difficult process of anger management, getting rid of bitterness and rage and anger, and oftentimes that comes with the assistance of others, whether it is a therapist or a counselor or a life group or a prayer group. Everybody needs a little bit of a village, a little help from our friends, right? But verse 32 is just as hard because it involves the process of gracious engagement, Now, oftentimes when we think about gracious engagement, we probably think about something really, really easy to do. Yes, I can be gracious in engaging others. I can see opportunities to do that. Most of the time, we're usually thinking about opportunities that involve us being someone's guardian angel, right? You know, there's a mom at the grocery store, and she's shuffling her groceries, and her kid is screaming and freaking out, and she's dropping groceries everywhere, and you swoop in to save the day. Gracious engagement. Thank you, kind sir. How wonderful of you to do such a nice thing. That's easy. Or the man on the side of the road with a flat tire. You've been there. You know what that feels like? It's 100 degrees outside. They're by themselves trying to fix a flat. I can help them do that. That's gracious engagement. Or your elderly neighbors who need some help mowing their lawn. Oh, they're right across the street. I've got a lawnmower and I've got a teenage son who needs something to do. Gracious engagement. Those are easy. That is not what Paul is talking about here in this moment. He's talking about how we're to respond in the midst of our anger. Because here's the thing about all of those situations. Do you know what all of those people didn't do to you in those situations? They didn't provoke you. They didn't provoke you. Much harder it is to be gracious when you have been provoked. Much harder it is to be gracious to the mom at the grocery store when before the tossling of the child, she yelled at you to get out of her way before struggling with her groceries. Much harder it is to be gracious about the man with the flat when he flipped you off on the highway before speeding past you. Much harder it is to have gracious engagement when your elderly neighbors are on the opposite side of the political spectrum than you and you don't like their posts on social media. Much harder it is to be gracious and to engage people graciously. It does not come naturally for us, surprise, to be kind and compassionate and forgiving towards those who have provoked us, to those who've hurt us, But that's just it. The true mark of a disciple of Christ 
is how we treat people who we are naturally inclined to hate. So if you want to be more like Christ, you have to learn to love and to greet your enemies like you would a friend or a loved one. In fact, Jesus says this very thing in Matthew chapter 5. Jesus says, if you love those who love you, well, what reward will you get? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? That's not hard. That actually comes easy to everyone. Gracious engagement when you have been provoked is the real mark of discipleship. Paul is not the only one in Ephesians with this thought. In fact, it was first spoken by Jesus himself in the world's most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. And he talks a lot in the sermon you come to find out in Matthew 5 through 7 about how to deal with anger. Jesus has a lot to say about this idea. Here's the first thing that he wants you to understand. This is how we are supposed to deal and approach others when we have anger that starts to well up. The first is this, seek to resolve the conflict. Seek to resolve the conflict. This is what Jesus says in chapter 5, verses 22 through 24. He says this, But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or a sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar... And there remember that your brother or sister has something against you. Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. Here's the thing. Jesus is not saying that the emotion of anger is sinful, but that unchecked anger leads to sin. Sound familiar? Maybe something Paul says much later to the early church in Ephesians, reiterating what Jesus so clearly states. Jesus makes it very clear in this passage that we are to deal with the sin of anger and to reconcile as much as it depends on us. Not everybody wants to reconcile with you, but as much as it depends on us, we are supposed to reconcile with others. In fact, and this is the kicker, Jesus tells us to deal with our anger and the anger of others before coming to the temple or the church and presenting your offerings to God. Can you imagine? Can you imagine such a thing? What would it look like if Ken got up here on a Sunday and said, now it is time for our communion and our offering. But before we get to our communion and offering, if you fought with your spouse last night and you and your kids haven't spoken in weeks and you have a couple of phone calls to make, get out of here. You're not supposed to be here. Leave your offering and go make things right, and then you can come back and worship with us. You thought COVID was going to be the thing that kept you out of the church? It might just be your lack of reconciliation. Can you imagine such a world? Here's a better question. How empty would this church be if we enforced this command? And we took Jesus' word seriously. How many people would actually be left in here? My guess is not that many. If we said, you're not allowed to worship here until you've made things right with your brother or sister. When you're dealing with conflict resolution, ask yourself these questions. What am I angry about? What am I angry about? And why? Why am I angry? Why am I so angry about this? Do I have a role to play in this? Is there some fault to be shared on both sides? And ultimately, what is an honest and what is a gracious way to deal with this anger? Here's the next thing Jesus teaches us, which is so important. In addition to seeking to resolve the conflict, he says, don't try to get even. (laughs) Man, that's a hard one. Don't try to get even. Later on in this same Sermon on the Mountain, uh, verses 44 and 45, he says this, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven, (laughs) disciples of Christ. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Have you ever wondered why your enemies seem to win sometimes? 
Why the unrighteous seem to live prosperous and fulfilled lives? Well, here's your answer, and I promise you you're not going to like it because it cuts me to the core every time I hear it. Do you want to know why that happens sometimes? Because God loves your enemies just as much as he loves you. Ugh. And that makes me a little angry. I'm not going to lie. God loves my enemies just as much as he loves me. How can that be? Doesn't he know what they have done to me? Doesn't he know how they have treated me? But it doesn't change it from being real. God loves your enemies just as much as he loves you. There is a common grace that God extends to all of his greatest creation. Even Jesus said it himself, the sun rises and falls on both the evil and the good. So what should our response be? How are we supposed to respond to such things? Jesus makes it clear. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Don't try to get even. Because revenge is the opposite of grace. Do you know what this requires of us? This requires of us to be the first to say, I'm sorry. Even if it's not your fault. Even if it's not fair. That's hard. Because I think our natural response is just to get angry. Fast. You want to treat conflict and injustice as an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to bring out the best in you. I think a lot of times in this world, in our society, the world will tell you to follow anger all the way out to the finish line because you deserve it. Take what's rightfully yours. Self-righteousness thrives in our culture and society. You have every right to be angry, and that should manifest itself however you see fit. And man, I wish that's what it said in God's word, because wouldn't that just be easier? But it's not. Jesus says the opposite of that thing. And here's where we can be different from the world. When we use opportunities, when we want to flare up in anger for the Holy Spirit to do something powerful in us, it communicates to the world that our God is real and living and active and doing something, transforming us from the inside out. Towards the end of the sermon, Jesus gives us this advice. It's in chapter 7, verses 3 through 5. He says this, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, excuse me, let me take that speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you can see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. In other words, sometimes you need to seek help with the anger issues in your own life. Now this is obviously so that you can be less judgmental of others, which is what this passage addresses. And that is not always easy to say. And it is not to say that there are not times when we need to speak the truth in love. Because there are times when we need to speak the truth in love. But you have to follow the example of Christ when you are doing such things. And it has been my experience that it is incredibly difficult to speak a loving truth to someone when you are so angry with them, you can hardly look at them. Or you're so angry with them, all you want to do is scream at them. Or you're shaking, you're so angry. Even if it's righteous and justifiable, it is hard to be loving when you are so angry. So when those times come, and they come for all of us, follow the lead of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, when he was angry, mostly with the teachers, the Pharisees, he would pause to pray. Jesus did so many times, especially when he was being tested by the religious leaders and the teachers, he would pause to pray, and he would give a thoughtful answer and a response. Jesus also knew when to withdraw because, you know, sometimes you just need a minute, right? I just, just need a minute. Jesus understood that, which is why he would withdraw at times to be still. Or sometimes to avoid an unnecessary confrontation and allow calmer heads to prevail. You have to know when to withdraw 
You have to pause to pray, maybe take a deep breath. But oftentimes, when we are angry, we tend to miss the very giant log, the plank in our own eye that needs to be dealt with. And sometimes in order to deal with that anger, we need to seek outside sources for our mental and our emotional health. We've all known or we've heard of people who live and make decisions out of their anger. And most of us would say that those decisions are generally emotionally stinted or unstable decisions. Sometimes it happens when your kids are little. Why did you hit your sister? Because I was mad. Because I was angry. And in their minds, their young minds, that seems to be a very logical <laughs> conclusion. Why did I do a thing? Because I was mad about it. But sometimes we never grow out of that as we get older. And we've all either known or heard of people who have made decisions, life-altering decisions, simply because they were angry. They acted out of that third anger, that thumos anger. And it changed lives. We see it on the news all the time. And it's awful. And when you try to get down to the bottom of it, there isn't a logical reason. It was simply because they let anger overtake them. And they gave the devil a place in their mind and their heart. And it's not just anger against others. Sometimes it's anger against ourselves. Sometimes we're mad at ourselves because we're not smart enough. Or we're not beautiful enough, or we don't have enough resources to accomplish what we want, or we don't have enough self-control. Sometimes we're angry with our past. We're angry with the mistakes that we've made or the things that others have done to us, hurtful things, harmful things, unforgivable things, things that we missed out on. My childhood was awful. I missed out on all these things because of neglect and abuse. And when left unchecked, these angers create a perfect place for the devil to do his work. Anger like this creates an inability to have deep and healthy relationships. And sometimes you don't even realize that it's happening because you've been angry for so long. It's just a way of life. You don't know. You don't know any different. But mark my words, it comes with you. And when left unchecked, it damages relationships present relationships, future relationships. Because of the actions of a few people in your past, you push everyone away and you close yourself off. I will never be hurt again. Never. I'm so angry about this thing. No one gets close. That's everyone. Friends, siblings, parents, children. You name it. Because of anger... You have a distrust of everyone and everything. Everyone is out to get you. Everyone. Because of anger, you deal with things like self-harm or anxiety or depression or maybe even a desire not to live anymore. Can you believe anger could stir up all of those things? It leaves a deep emotional scar. Now, if this is you, if you fit any of those categories and you're watching us online or you're here with us now, please let us know. Raise a hand and tell us online that you want prayer so that we can help you get help of a professional nature, a counselor, a friend, or a therapist. We don't want you to have to struggle with that alone anymore. You know, as Christians, we are called to a higher moral standard. And when we usually hear that, we say, oh, well, of course, yeah, of course we are. <laughs> you know, and I get what that means, because I've read the good book, and I understand all the things. I'm not supposed to live a debaucherous life. I'm not supposed to fall into lust traps. I'm supposed to turn the other cheek and whatnot, and I get that. I get that. I understand what you mean when you say we're above reproach, higher moral standard. And those things are all good, and they're all right. But what if a higher moral standard started with something as simple and as complex as watching our anger. Because according to the Bible, very little of our anger is justifiable. There's righteous anger, but that tends to be very limited in scope. Righteous if you're talking about being angry with sin, 
but not the sinner. But things like they started it, or she said, or they broke the relationship by, or that's all self-righteous. And that might be right, and it might feel right in its rationale, in your rationale. But it doesn't justify the type of anger that leads us to inaction, or worse, harmful actions. There's no justification for that. Whatever you've decided is righteous in your mind crosses over into sin when it renders you inactive, or worse, active in all of the harmful ways. Here's what I believe to be true. I believe at some level all of us struggle with that. We all have our things, our ticks, our triggers, our things that all you have to do is say this or do this, and that will just set me off. Here's a list of things that made me angry. I gave you all my list at the very beginning. But I truly believe that with God's help, that we can recognize and resolve unhealthy expressions of anger. But it's going to take God's help. It's big. And anger is powerful. And sometimes it makes us feel powerful, which is why it can be so addicting. In some ways, we feel like we can lord it over someone else to elevate ourselves above someone else. And even that statement is sinful in practice. At the tail end of Ephesians 4, in verse 32, Paul says something really, really, really important. He tells you to replace all of the angry things with kindness and compassion and forgiveness. And then he says, forgiving each other just as in Christ, God forgave you. You see, there's this idea of forgiveness being grounded in God's forgiveness for you. You see, growing in grace requires us to remember how God has forgiven us. Paul calls us to remember God's forgiving ways towards us in the past which is why we take time every week to celebrate Holy Communion. You know that moment where we take the bread and the cup that symbolizes Christ's sacrifice for us on the cross, and we remember, and we don't just remember the action that Christ did for us, we remember what it represents, and it represents forgiveness. Forgiveness. Which is why you hear Paul say, not just in this letter to this church, but in a lot of his writings, you will say, love as Christ has loved you, forgive as Christ has forgiven you, and so on and so on and so on. Remember what Christ did for you because you are supposed to act and react in the same way. You see, what Christ has done for you in the past, he expects you to do for others in the present. Which is why it's a constant reminder that Paul gives all the time. So as we enter into this time of communion today, I want you to think on these two things. Simply this, what has the Lord done for you? What has the Lord done for you? And how has the Lord forgiven you? I think when we are constantly reminded of those two things, it makes it easier for us to forgive others. You guys, anger is a big thing. And it's hard. And it's hard for us to rein in. It's hard for us to be gracious with others who have provoked us. But in the same way that Christ died for the ungodly, he expects us to love others with the same kind of love that he gives to everyone, and yes, even our enemies. What has the Lord done for you? How has the Lord forgiven you? I believe this is the beginning of our journey to conquering anger. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your Son, Jesus Christ, who paid it all and gave it all so that we could be forgiven. God, it's amazing how sometimes that's easy for us to forget, especially when we have been provoked and we are living in our anger and we can justify our reason for being so mad. But God, help us never to forget, in light of the cross, everything that you have done for us how deeply you loved us so that we can turn around and extend that same kind of grace to others, moving ourselves beyond just anger management,
but gracious encounters, Lord. We love you and we thank you. In your son's name we pray. Amen.